Hello, and welcome back to our little series on church architecture and spirituality. Today we're going to be looking at the churches of the East and the importance of the Dome. We've already seen that early Christian churches in both East and West were built around two main patterns, an elongated basilica, you can see here on the right, uh, and a round building, you can see here on the left, centred on a saint's tomb or on a holy place. Broadly speaking, the basilica form developed into the characteristic Latin cross pattern we see in medieval cathedrals, and the imposition of a circle or a dome on a square that we find in the martyrium, or that circular form that we've just seen, developed into the Greek cross formation that we see in the Eastern or Byzantine churches uh, that carries on even today. The Latin cross has this elongated lower section, whereas the Greek cross has arms of more or less equal length. The Greek cross, as the basis of church design, though, has a few challenges. First of all, there are awkward spaces. Which arm of the cross should be preferred over the three others? Where should the altar go? In the middle, under the dome, where it says nave? or at the end of one of the arms of the cross, where it says sanctuary. How are processions possible when there are clearly two axes, uh, west to east and uh, north to south, and the altar might even be under the dome? Now, the controversy about these shapes continued even into the design of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome uh, through the 15 and early 1600s. The architects wanted a Greek cross design, uh, but the church authorities wanted more of a Latin basilica where you could process uh, down up to the altar. Uh, the same thing happened in St Paul's Cathedral in London in the late 1600s. Christopher Wren wanted more of a, a Greek cross design, uh, but the dean and chapter wanted a longer design uh, for similar reasons. Generally speaking, in the East, these problems were resolved by extending one of the arms of the cross into a formal apse, where it says here, nave and narthex. Uh, this had the merit of preserving the martyrium format, that is a central dome over a sacred uh, uh, um, uh, tomb or a sacred space, and the Greek cross. And yet it lent itself to these new ways of celebrating the Eucharist and emphasising the new relationships of power that were developing in the church after the Edict of Milan. Here you can see the main provinces of the Roman Empire in the period just before the one we're about to look at. Uh, and this map shows us how the empire was more or less divided into two in 330 AD between the Greek-speaking East, here in blue, and the Latin-speaking West, in red. The earliest masterpiece of Byzantine architecture is San Vitale in Ravenna. It was begun in 526, and it took about 20 years to complete uh, at the time, the Roman Empire had definitively fallen into two halves following the invasion of the barbarians, and the plan of the church may reflect the design of the Byzantine Imperial Palace audience chamber. The beauty of the Greek cross design, characteristic of the Eastern Church, is that it lends itself perfectly to roofing over the intersection of the arms of the cross with a dome and its related pendentives. Uh, and this leads to interesting architectural effects. It lends this sort of vertical axis to the church, which that longitudinal Roman basilica actually lacks. The undulating niches of the arms of the Greek cross support half domes that draw your eye upwards. And many internal details of the churches also invoke the Byzantine imperial palace. The undersides of the arches are richly decorated with these faces of the saints, as if they too are in courtly attendance uh, on the divine service. Here you can see Christ seated in majesty, wearing the imperial robes. He's flanked by two angels with their wands of office, and Christ hands the imperial crown to the emperor on his right and a model of the building to the bishop on his left. 
Um, and here on one side of this apse mosaic, uh, the Emperor Justinian is flanked by his retinue, including Maximianus, the Bishop of Ravenna, which at this time was the capital city of the Byzantine Empire in Italy. Uh, his attendants there carry the gospel book and a burning thurible, and he's holding the bowl for the bread of the Eucharist. On the left of the apse, we see the Empress Theodora. She also is dressed in imperial purple, and she's accompanied by her attendants and her clergy. And instead of the bowl for the bread, she's carrying a golden chalice for the wine of the Eucharist. This mosaic here shows us some of the scenes from the Hebrew scriptures that relate to the story of Abraham. Sarah is on the left there, while Abraham offers food to the three seated angels in the middle of the mosaic. On the right, Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac when the hand of God intervenes through those clouds. And above, we see these two Nike, the victorious angels, uh, who were taken uh, from sculptures on Roman imperial arches uh, that were made to celebrate the triumph of the emperor. But here they're holding the sign of the cross, the sign of the triumph of Christ. Uh, the following three slides give us an overall impression of the internal arrangement of the church. Here we have the altar that is uh, surrounded by the mosaics that we've just seen. Here we look down into the nave from behind the altar. And here we can see these intersecting half domes, uh, many of which are now decorated with uh, Baroque uh, friezes. San Lorenzo in Milan is also a good example of this church plan that's modelled on the Byzantine court. Here is the ground plan, uh, and uh, here is the absidal mosaic of Christ uh, in judgment, surrounded by the twelve apostles who are wearing imperial court robes with the purple band uh, running down them. Now we're going to take a quick look at a church that's in ruins. It's situated here in Ephesus in western Turkey. And it's going to show us a sort of fusion between the Latin cross uh, modelled on the Western Basilica plan, and the increasing importance of the dome in the east. It's the Church of St. John in Ephesus. It is more along the lines of a Latin Basilica cross, uh, but the two small domes over the nave on the right-hand side here, the dome over the apse on the left, and the three larger domes covering the crossing and the north and south transepts in the middle uh, give it a sort of verticality that tempers this sort of linearity that's found in a Latin cross basilica type church. Unfortunately, this is all that's left of it today, four Byzantine columns and this ranked synthronon uh, back here uh, for the seating of the clergy. The essential idea here was to uh, replace this sort of linear processional route to the apse uh, with its mosaic of Christ in the conch over the altar. Uh, you can see that here in Santa Pudenziana uh, in Rome with a vertical dimension of the church, which places the icon of Christ in the center of the dome rather than at the end of the procession. When it's set against this background of these wonderful gold tesserae, the figures seem to be floating in heaven. Uh, this is a good example in the central dome of the Paraclesion in the Pamakaristos church in Istanbul. Here it is. And uh, here is the Peribleptos Pantanasa church in Greece, uh, unfortunately, the dome uh, uh, mosaic has not survived, but it gives you an idea of this vertical dimension uh, that's present in the churches of the East, much more so than in the churches of the West of this uh, particular period. Osias Lucas Monastery uh, has a famous Theotokos mosaic in the apse over the altar uh, of Mary holding Christ. Uh, but it's also got a wonderful soaring dome uh, with Christ, his right hand uh, rising in blessing and his left hand 
holding the Book of Life. Here you can see the Theotokos uh, seated on this wonderful uh, cushioned throne. Uh, and here we can see Christ in the uh, crossing uh, here with this uh, square and the great dome over the uh, centre. The effect of uh, this layout is not a sort of linear and logical development towards the altar as the sole centre of attention, but rather this eternal circular present, uh, a cyclical view of time that brings the past into the present and, and sees both together. So you can see here that the architecture influences the theology of the Eastern Church and the theology of the Eastern Church influences its architecture. It's essentially a cube um, surmounted by a dome and it shows the welding together of heaven and earth. Heaven in the dome, earth with its four corners, its four um, uh, uh, humours, its four uh, compass directions. Uh, as a square beneath. To the east of the dome, and we're going to see this example here in Torcello, uh, in Santa Maria Assunta, in the Venetian uh, lagoon, uh, there is a templon. It's a sort of screen with a solid uh, latticework base. Uh, you can see here these columns uh, supporting these icons over the top here. Uh, here is the uh, apse at the far end. Um, and here you can see a close-up of the templon that is separating the nave uh, from the apse where the clergy uh, would be. Uh, here you can see the west end of that church, and here is a closer picture of the Theotokos uh, in the apsidal uh, uh, um, uh, east end. Uh, and here at Alba Fusens in Abruzzi in Italy, uh, where it's topped with these sort of columns and a beam. Uh, here's the temple on this sort of barrier down here. Um, in the end, this screen that you can see was hung with icons and it developed into this solid structure with three doors that we now know as the iconostasis. The iconostasis began life as this low balustrade around the sanctuary in early Byzantine churches into this high screen by the 15th century. Uh, the iconostasis is covered with these icons of holy personages, including Mary, Joseph, the evangelists, the apostles, the saints, the patriarchs, uh, and the space that it encloses is only accessible to the initiated who move through these three doors, the north and south door and the central royal door. Uh, the use of the doors further enhances the symbolism uh, of the rites that take place. For example, the gospel is carried in procession out of the north door, and then after the procession enters the sanctuary again through the royal door. And the royal door represents the curtain of the temple that was mentioned in Matthew's gospel as being torn in two uh, at the moment of Christ's death. The people's worship space, the nave, becomes a more fluid space than in the traditional Western nave with its pews. Uh, people can move around under the dome and light candles before uh, the icons. We're now going to look at perhaps the most famous and the most beautiful of the Eastern churches, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Istanbul, uh, circled here in purple in the, in the Golden Horn. It was built in Constantinople in 537 AD. It was commissioned by the Emperor Justinian I. Uh, the architect's names are known, Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Thrales. Uh, Justin decreed that the church should be built over an early basilica-like church that was constructed under Constantine the Great. The church combines this central dome with, a, with an axiality uh, that would be typical of a basilica that you can see here on the right, the Basilica of Old St. Peter's. Uh, this is its equivalent here at Hagia Sophia. Uh, but it counterpoises the two to make a very complex space. Four massive piers in the darker colour here make a square and colonnades between the squares to the north and south suggest this basilica type space that leads to a sanctuary uh, defined by this little apse uh, here at the far end uh, that projects beyond the rectangle of the plan. Uh, above everything else is this large, although uh, quite shallow, dome. 
Uh, it reminds us of the balance perhaps achieved by Leonardo da Vinci between the circle and the square in which the human form uh, harmoniously sits with its uh, uh, arms uh, and legs uh, 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 stretched out. The vertical thrust of the dome, in fact, dominates this building. The dome seems to hover over a ring of light. Uh, the ground space is a little baffling. Uh, it's a little confusing, but as the eye moves upwards towards the dome, your eye finds peace and the building makes sense. It's a sacred space that actually requires you to look upwards to make sense of where you're placed on the ground. Now, these uh, domes earned the name Domes of Heaven. And as we've seen, they often had an image of Jesus in mosaic on them that depicted the Saviour that looked down and, and blessed the people. Uh, the Hagia Sophia dome was covered in this golden mosaic uh, that picked up the light and reflected it all around the room. The whole church gives you the impression that it was fashioned by God as a place where God chose uh, to dwell. It's interesting to compare the construction of this dome with that of the Pantheon in Rome. The Pantheon is a, uh, a Pantheon is a classical Greek, a classical Roman building uh, built under the Roman Empire, but it seems to be rather stacked up, uh, rather heavy, a little bit like an adventurous child's experiment uh, with building blocks. Here's what it looks like. Uh, below with this central hall admitting a little bit of light. Whereas Hagia Sophia seems to defy gravity. You don't ask, you know, how did they get all of that heavy stuff up there? Hagia Sophia seems to float on air. And this is thanks to this notion of a ribbed vault, these ribs that we see going up that enabled the architects to pierce the rim of the dome with windows. Now, the church was built very close to tolerance. That's to say, it pushed the laws of physics to their outer edge just before breaking point. And it's fallen down a few times in earthquakes and had to be buttressed back up again so that these massive outer bulwarks take the downward thrust of the dome. Even at the time, people thought it was a miracle. Only God could keep it suspended up there. And when the building was finished, Justinian was supposed to have said, glory to God, who has thought me worthy to finish this work. Solomon, I have outdone you. These domed Byzantine churches were informed by a different purpose from the earlier Roman basilicas. And it was an architecture less focused on awe of earthly power expressed through these sacred processions towards the altar. It was based on an awe of the divine itself. It's an architecture that's less focused on the altar and the Eucharist as a means through which uh, one can encounter God. Instead, it's fostering this individual, personal, spiritual reckoning with an awesome divinity uh, made manifest in this glorious light, in this glorious space. A bit more like a temple, uh, as though the God at the centre of the temple isn't a statue. Uh, it's light itself, the first of God's creations. Even in Hagia Sophia, then, this influence of the Roman basilica with its uh, nave and apse could be felt. Uh, but later on, the architects abandoned this connection to pagan Greek and Roman architecture and set off to experiment on their own. An example of this would be the triple apsed church uh, here in Famagusta Old City in Cyprus. Um, some of these churches abandoned the synthronon and placed two side apses, as we can see here, uh, on either side of the original east end apse. Uh, this is incorporating the symbol of the Trinity into the church. Uh, the lower space, uh, here's the exterior of the same church, became increasingly complicated with these geometrical forms imposing themselves on other geometrical forms. But the eye is constantly drawn upwards to the central dome. Here's the triple apsed church of Santa Maria in Solario in Bresica in Italy. And here is the glorious dome uh, that rises above it. New buildings around the chancel were added to keep sacred vessels and robes. The buildings are called sacristies. And now there's not just a west-east processional route, but a north-south one as well. 
uh, when the clergy and officials would walk from the sacristy to the central area under the dome, the procession was no longer through the narthex and nave to the apse, but through the transepts and its associated buildings under the dome uh, up to the apse. Uh, the effect would have been to enhance the exclusivity and the importance of the restricted clerical areas of the church. The divinity of Christ, above all, was emphasised by these new churches and the rites that happened in them, and only certain people, the patriarchs, the bishops, the priests, the deacons, had access to the holiest places uh, and proximity to the holiest monuments uh, in the uh, moments in the rite. Ordinary worshippers uh, turn to hierophanies at uh, moments when the divine breaks through into the human plane. The Eucharist surely was one of those moments, and an encounter with the spirit of a martyr uh, in the martyrium under the dome uh, was another one. Now, what was the legacy of Byzantine architecture? The final and formal schism between the East and West took place in 1054, but there were already considerable differences in language, liturgy, spirituality and architecture between the two parts of the former Roman Empire. The Eastern Church spread northwards into the Balkans and Russia, uh, who still acknowledged the honorary primacy of the Patriarch of Constantinople. The Byzantine model of the Greek cross and the central dome is emphasising the corporate and community relationship with God. The focus is less on the individual and more on the church as a community that's joined in worship. Uh, the believer communicates with God through a common liturgy, all of this taking place under the central dome that is conceived of as the vault of heaven. Uh, the Byzantine model also lends itself to a mystical understanding of the liturgy, a direct encounter uh, with the light of the world, mystically understood to be present uh, through the action of the divine trinity by the agency of the Holy Spirit. The mosaics, the iconography, together with the music, the domes, encouraged the believer to understand that they were one tribe uh, under God, uh, created beings worshipping around the divine throne, the cherubim, the, cerubim, the uh, uh, seraphim, the celestial powers, the, the martyrs, the saints, all present in the same space. And we mustn't imagine, perhaps, that the non-clergy believers were constantly following the proceedings with rapt attention, uh, seated in orderly rows. Even now, in a Greek Orthodox uh, church, you'll find that the laity occupies the sacred space in a very distinctive way. Even when services are going on, many worshippers engage in personal devotions, often in the veneration of icons. Others might be walking around, talking to friends or, or family. Just being present uh, in community, in a church, furthers this relationship with the divine. There are churches, surely, in the West that are built more on the Byzantine uh, model, even though they may be churches that are now used for the Latin rite. This is a famous example of St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Here you can see on a Greek cross uh, pattern. Venice had uh, very close associations, obviously, uh, with the East. And this is a church that we will be going to be uh, exploring next time. Until then, thank you for joining us uh, and do like and subscribe and put any questions or observations that you might have just underneath the video and we'll all do our best uh, to answer them. Until next time, thank you for being with us and cheerio for now.